Hello everyone, this is exercise 8 of the class Communication Networks 2 from the Deutsche Telekom Share of Communication Networks. My name is Christian Fielos and I'm going to talk about machine learning for congestion control today. Let's have a look at a very simple topology first. This is the classical point-to-point -point topology where a single source node is connected with a destination through a link. And in this example here, the source node runs some applications that generate traffic. So the packets flow strictly from left to right. And the link has a finite capacity, also called the bandwidth or the link speed, bits per second, that is unknown to the source node. So the applications that generate the traffic may generate data so fast that the link is too slow to handle it. And in this case, we say we already have congestion because then the link cannot process the amount of data in time. Ideally, you would want the source node to uh, generate traffic with a sending rate that is exactly equivalent to the link capacity. But let's have a look what happens if the applications actually are too fast. So what we see here is a network stack as it could be located inside the source node. Here we see the applications that are running in the source that generate the traffic. And down here we see the network interface card that is attached to the link we've seen earlier. Now this is a network device that pushes the packets into the channel. And the speed of this network device is limited by the channel it is attached to. So it is limited by the link capacity we have seen earlier. Now we ask the question, what happens if the applications generate traffic with a faster rate than a network interface card can actually handle? So in that case, these packets have to be somewhere inside the network stack of the source node. So these packets are passed down to the IP stack, but they are forwarded to the correct output port. So in this case, we only have one. There's only one network interface card depicted here. So these packets are forwarded to, the, to a queuing system that consists of a queuing discipline, also called a queue disk, and a driver queue, which is just a hardware first in, first out queue. Now queue disks have been discussed earlier in earlier lectures, but these two queues together form a queuing system, and this is where the packets are in case of congestion. So let's have a closer look at the queuing system. Here we see a queuing system that consists of a queue and an interface. It was the network interface card of the previous slide. And the interface here has a service rate of mu. As we've discussed earlier, this service rate is limited by the link capacity. Now there's different scenarios for such queuing systems. If the mean arrival rate lambda is smaller than mu, then the queue will drain. That is because the interface is fast enough to process all the incoming uh, traffic. So there's no queue that is going to build up. On the other hand, if the incoming uh, traffic rate lambda exceeds the uh, service rate mu, then the queue will fill up. And the consequence will be that newly arriving packets will experience queuing delay because there's other packets before it in line that will be processed first by the interface. So they have to wait for other packets to be processed. This can go on until the queue actually overflows because every queue has a finite buffer in reality. And then what we experience is packet loss that is caused by congestion. It is important to understand that this packet loss is different to random packet loss that uh, is caused by bit errors or something like that. This is packet loss caused by congestion. Then of course we also have the last scenario where the two rates match exactly. And in this scenario, the number of enqueued packets actually remain constant in the system. So let's have a look at a classical topology that is used to study congestion control. Here we see the dumbbell topology. It consists of K source nodes that are connected to their corresponding destinations on the other side through two gateways, G1 and G2. Now this topology is interesting for congestion control because it models a single bottleneck. And bottlenecks is where the congestion occurs because of the max flow min cut theorem. 
So in this example here, because all of the traffic flows from left to right once again from the sources to the destinations, we can immediately say where it is most likely that the congestion will happen. And that is at the queuing system that connects the gateway one, G1, with the bottleneck link in the middle. So in this scenario here, all of the source nodes will compete for the available bandwidth given by the link capacity of the bottleneck link. So let's think about what happens if the source nodes do not run any kind of congestion control algorithm, but they want to send with a speed that is faster than the bottleneck can handle. So if the source nodes run protocols like TCP that have automatic repeat requests and resend drop packets, and they also send at a rate that is faster than the bottleneck link capacity, then we will have a queue in the network that constantly overflows and that drops arriving packets as a sign of severe congestion. Now the source nodes, on the other end, they run automatic repeat request and they resend these drop packets. And if they don't run any form of congestion control algorithm, they also do not slow down. So we are constantly having a load that is too high for the bottleneck to handle. And the, opera uh, the network operates in a state with maximum queuing delay and there's frequent congestion losses because the queue overflows. Now this scenario is called congestion collapse and it is the reason why the source nodes have to run congestion control algorithms. But why is it actually so hard to avoid congestion in the first place? In the networks today, the complex tasks are handled by the endpoints. So most commonly, a congestion control algorithm is implemented inside source nodes, and they control the sending rate of a source node. But a source node has very little knowledge about the network state. So for example, it does not know the topology it is embedded in, and it also has no idea about the traffic that is generated by other source nodes that might flow through the same bottleneck. And then it also does not know any network parameters, so it doesn't know the link speeds or queue sizes. As we've seen earlier, it would be nice to know the bottleneck link capacity, but unfortunately it is not directly known to the source node. So we are looking at a distributed problem and there's no central coordination. And then we also have the freedom of choice uh, from the perspective of the source nodes. They have their own network stacks and they can implement their own congestion control algorithms. They do not have to be the same. And then last but not least, the congestion signals that are returned by the network, so the signals that you would use to actually detect congestion, are noisy and misleading. The first congestion signal we have is packet loss. A packet loss is ambiguous because there's also random packet loss caused by bit errors or packet erasures of the channel. So packet loss can mean that there was a queue that overflowed and that is why the packet was lost. But it can also just be random. This is why it's ambiguous. And then as a second signal we have queuing delay or just the latency. But of course this signal is also uncertain because sometimes there are temporarily traffic spikes that cause queuing delay, but only for a short amount of time. And these are not really a sign of severe congestion. And then we also have to uh, remember that there's a lot of multiplexing jitter. So that means that a lot of sources have very short flows, which is come and go. So applications that only have a little bit of traffic to send. And these also can cause queuing delay only for a short amount of time that is very unpredictable. So this is why the queuing delay is a very noisy signal in practice. And then the third one listed here are early uh, congestion notification flags, but they are not covered inside this lecture. So a more sophisticated thing is that source nodes can actually estimate network parameters. But of course, like any other estimate, these network uh, parameter estimates can be wrong. So the first one to estimate would be the bottleneck rate or the link capacity of the bottleneck. And you can do this by looking at the acknowledgements that you receive in a certain amount of time. And then the, the second one listed here is the propagation delay. 
But for example, if there's a change in routing inside the network, then suddenly it might happen that we are not even going through the same bottleneck anymore. And then suddenly these estimates are very wrong. And we have to remember that when we use network parameter estimates. The first type of rate control algorithms that a source node can use is called direct rate control. And with these algorithms, the source nodes pace the packets they send out. So they add time gaps between each consecutive packet that is sent out into the network. Now, the advantage of this direct rate control is that the sources avoid sending out packet bursts that might lead to temporary queuing delays somewhere inside the network. But the disadvantage of this algorithm is that it is not very reactive when a lot of packets are lost. So let's imagine a scenario where a queue is overflowing and it's dropping a lot of packets that arrive there, a lot of consecutive packets. Then the receiver will not respond with acknowledgments to the source. But if the source runs a direct rate control algorithm, it will nevertheless continue sending out packets into the network, even though no acknowledgments are arriving anymore. And this is, of course, bad in terms of congestion because we already have a network that is congested. What the source should actually do is slow down in this case. That is why protocols like TCP use a sliding window, also called the congestion window, that limits the amount of bytes in flight that it can be somewhere in the network but are unacknowledged at a, any given point in time. So here we see an example of a sliding window where the packets from 4 to 9 are inside the window. Now the packets 4, 5 and 6 have already been sent out by the source node, but they are not yet acknowledged by the receiver. Whereas the packets 7, 8 and 9 have not been sent out, but the source node can send them out because they are inside the sliding window. Now packet 10 is the first packet that is outside of the sliding window and the source will not continue to send out packet 10 even if it is already available from the application. Now, once the source receives a new acknowledgement, this sliding window moves to the right and now includes the packet 10. It can be sent out by the source node. That is why the congestion window is said to be clocked by acknowledgements or ac clocked. Because whenever an acknowledgement arrives, it moves to the right and makes it possible for the source node to send out more packets. So in this way, you can imagine that we stay reactive towards the network because we can only send new data if we get acknowledgements from the receiver as a signal that some data has actually left the network. And in this way, we control the load to the data that is inside the network. And it is a nice way to control congestion. Most TCP congestion control algorithms use uh, the congestion window as their control parameter instead of di directly adjusting the sending rate. So for the sending rate we know that the target value is the link capacity of the bottleneck link. But what about the target value of, a, of the congestion window size? To understand this, we have to understand the concept of the pipe. So here once again we see a network with one source and one destination connected through two gateways with a bottleneck link called L2. It's a very simple topology with only three links, L1, L2, and L3. The same network as a pipe is illustrated down here. We have to understand two concepts of a pipe. So the first one is the width of the pipe here is proportional to the rate of the link. So this width here is proportional to the rate of L1, whereas this width here is proportional to the rate of L2, and so on. The second one is the length of the pipe is proportional to the round trip time. So the round trip time is the time it takes to send a packet from S to D and back. Now, if we look at this illustration further, we see that the source has generated four packets here. They're very close by because the link speed L1 is very high they will soon arrive at the gateway G1. But once they arrive here, and the, the gateway can only send with a speed 
that is equivalent to the capacity of L2. These packets will be stretched out in time, as we can see here. That is illustrated by the width of these rectangles. They expand in comparison to the uh, width of these rectangles here. So, in other words, the width of these rectangles is directly proportional to the bottleneck rate. So, to answer the question, how much data can fit into the, can fit into this pipe here? We just have to imagine the situation where L2 is entirely filled up here with packets. So, starting from this point here up to this point, we are entirely filled with packets. There's no spacing in the middle here anymore. And of course, because the length of the pipe is also relevant for the amount of packets that fit in, we have to take the product of the bottleneck rate, which is proportional to the size of this packet, and the round trip time, which defines how long this pipe is. And this product is called the bandwidth delay product, and it is the upper bound for the amount of data that can be in flight at any given point in time if you have a network like this, a pipe like this. So these two uh, values, the bottleneck rate and the round trip time, are the two characteristic values for a pipe that define how much data you can fit into this network. Now, why is it so that down here, where all the acknowledgements are returned by the receiver, they are very small in size, of course, because acknowledgements are small compared to data packets. Why is this not relevant? Well, exactly because these acknowledgement packets are much smaller than the data packets. So we will not have a problem down here in terms of link speeds or that we overfill this pipe. It is going to be the problem on the forward path where all the data flows, flows from the source to the destination. And this is why the bandwidth delayed product is our target value of the congestion window. To compute the bandwidth delay product with this formula here, we actually take the round trip time without any queuing delay. But of course, this is not the whole story because in this network here, there can be queuing delay right here at the gateway one that is connected to the link L2. So this queuing delay can also add to the round trip delay that is measured at the source node. So to really compute the bandwidth delay product of a network, we mean the round trip time in terms of just a pure propagation delay from the sender to the receiver. To understand this even further, we have, a, we have to take a look at this graph here. We see on the x-axis the data in flight. and On the y-axis on the first graph, we see the delivery rate from the source to the destination. While down here on the second graph, we see the round trip time. So in the beginning, when we increase the data in flight, we see that the delivery rate proportionally goes up as well, while the round trip time just stays flat. That is because in this green, uh, with this green line here, we operate in, an, in a state where we are actually sending data beneath the bottleneck rate. And this is why we do not add any kind of queuing delay to our round trip time. So the round trip time just stays flat right at the propagation delay of the network while we ramp up the delivery rate and get a higher throughput like this. But this trend continues until we reach the bottleneck rate here depicted with CL. And then of course this limits our throughput so we cannot go, we cannot increase this delivery rate any higher than this point here. We will just stay flat. But then if we go down, on the other hand, we see that the round trip time, in that case, starts increasing once we, once we reach the bandwidth delay product of the network. Now, what happens here is we send data into the network that can actually not be processed fast enough because we already reached the bottleneck rate. So everything that happens is this data is stored in a queuing system somewhere inside the network and it's going to add queuing delay to our connection. Now this trend continues until we actually reach the point where our data in flight matches the bandwidth delay product plus the queue size at the bottleneck. Now when this happens also the latency just goes flat because now we are operating in the state 
where the queue just constantly overflows and it is already entirely full. So it cannot add any more queuing delay to our transmission. So these are the basic uh, mechanisms that we have to understand to see that what is the ideal value for the congestion window and that is the bandwidth delay product because it is only the bandwidth delay product that gives us the maximum amount of throughput while at the same time staying at the minimum amount of latency. So let's have a look at the classical TCP new Reno congestion control algorithm. The algorithm was designed during a time where most networks were completely wired and whenever you would see a, con uh, a loss, a packet loss, it was a very high probability that this packet loss would have been caused by congestion, not just occur randomly. So this is why TCP New Reno is a pure loss-based protocol. Whenever it sees a packet loss, it immediately uh, infers that this is caused by congestion. It operates with two modes. So the first mode is slow start. In slow start, the goal is to ramp up the sending rate exponentially fast until we reach the bottleneck capacity. Now, because we ramp up in uh, exponentially fast, we actually overshoot. And this is why we'll see later in the pseudocode, we also have to reduce our sending rate after slow start detects its first packet loss. Now, once the packet loss is detected, slow start is exited and another mode is entered, which is called congestion avoidance. In congestion avoidance, we grow the sending rate slowly, so only linearly over time, to probe for new bandwidth. So the reason why we do this is because other source nodes might stop their transmission and this frees bandwidth that is now available for us at the bottleneck link. We cannot just keep the sending rate at the same level because we want to utilize this newly read bandwidth in case it is there. Let's have a look at the pseudocode now. So the algorithm waits until a, a new acknowledgement arrives. And then the first check it does is it checks if it is a duplicate acknowledgement. Because in the case of TCP, if we received three duplicate acknowledgements in a row, then this is the signal for packet loss. Now, if this occurs, we have our sending rate or we have the congestion window and we enter a mode that is called recovery mode. It is not covered here, but this, we stay in recovery mode until no more packets are considered lost by TCP. And then we continue with uh, congestion avoidance. But let's say we do not, we do not uh, receive a duplicate acknowledgement, but instead a normal one. Then we see if we are in slow start, we increase the congestion window by one segment whenever we re receive an acknowledgement. Now, within one round trip time, we know that uh, we have exactly the size of our congestion window many packets inside the network. So this is why this kind of attempt doubles the congestion window within one, one round trip time. On the other hand, in congestion avoidance, we have another formula that is equivalent to adding one segment within one round trip time to the congestion window, which is exactly a linear growth. Now, after these uh, manipulations to the congestion window are done, the TCP socket, uh, socket com continues to send out the outstanding packets if the congestion window allows it. And this is the control loop that we keep on going until the transmission ends because the application has no more data to send. So let's have a look at the graph of the congestion window over time of TCP new Reno. Here we assume that there is no competition from other source nodes and the source tries to find the bottleneck capacity, it can use the entire bandwidth for its, for its own transmission. So we see that in the beginning we have the exponential growth of the congestion window. And we overshoot the bandwidth delay product and we also overshoot the bandwidth delay product plus the queue size at the bottleneck. So why do we even overshoot this value? That's because there's a feedback delay of one round trip time so the sender does not immediately see that we have congestion losses because the queue overflows. Instead it has to. There's a delay of our round trip time so we ramp up even further until we have three duplicate acknowledgements 
and the sender then sees that there's packet loss. Then we have the congestion window and we enter congestion avoidance where we have linear growth over time, as we said earlier. This linear growth continues until we once again reach this threshold of the bandwidth delay product plus the queue size. And then we drop off again, have it again, and we continue the linear growth again until we reach this threshold and so on. This is why it is characteristic of TCP New Reno that the congestion window against time is a sawtooth plot. Let's think about how we can actually use reinforcement learning to do our own congestion control algorithm. So in reinforcement learning, we have an agent that interacts with an environment by taking actions. The environment has a state that is only partially observable to the agent. And the environment also returns rewards to the agent. Now the goal of the agent is to find a policy that maximizes the long-term reward it receives from the environment by smartly taking actions given observations that it sees. Now, in congestion control, the environment is the network state. As we said earlier, the network state is not directly visible to the agent, but instead it only sees congestion signals. So this is why there is a partial observability block here. Now, the actions that an agent takes, um, they are directly uh, controlling the sending rate by, e by either controlling the congestion window or a pacing rate. And the goal is to avoid congestion. So now we have to think about how we can design the actions, the rewards, and the observations so that we can tackle the task of congestion control. Earlier, we already talked about some congestion signals. So once again, we have the throughput that we can estimate by looking at the acknowledgements that are returned by the receiver. And we have the round trip time that we can also estimate if the packets that we send out are actually timestamped. And then we have the loss rate. Some other estimates are the propagation delay. And here we actually see how we can do it. So we take the minimum observed round trip time in some time window. The idea is that just by chance, a packet within the time window might not experience any kind of queuing delay. So in that case, its round trip time is nearly uh, the same, like the real true prop propagation delay of the pipe. And then we can also estimate a bottleneck rate by just looking at the maximum um, uh, throughput that we observe in yet another time window. As we've said earlier, the network cannot go any faster than the bottleneck rate. So that is why this estimate also makes sense with the maximum operation. For the observations, we can also compute gradients or relative changes, and we can use normalization. You have observation signals that are between 0 and 1. So here's an example of a vector. So this vector has four elements. And the first one is just a round trip time with uh, a normalization with the estimated uh, propagation delay. And then we also take the gradient of the round trip time and we also take the gradient of the throughput and the loss rate. But to make uh, use of the pattern recognition um, capabilities of the machine learning algorithm, we can actually show the agent not only the most recent observation, but we can show it a history of the last k observations to use pattern recognition. So the machine learning algorithm can try to make sense of uh, how the observation signals evolve over time to get a better picture of the network state. Another important topic in reinforcement learning is the design of a reward signal. So in terms of congestion control, we have a multi-objective reward signal. We want to maximize the throughput and minimize the delay and the packet losses. So here we see two examples, two functions that can achieve exactly that if you give it the, the right weights. So the first one is just linear. It takes the throughput, the latency, and the losses and adds them together with weights. And the second one is a weighted logarithm of products function that can achieve something similar with the right weights. So here we already see that there can be trade-offs. If we put a lot of weight on maximizing the throughput, 
then the agent might actually maximize the throughput at the cost of the delay, so with an increased delay. Because the agent will learn that maximizing throughput has the most priority, and even an increased delay does, is not so harmful for its reward signal. So here we already see that designing the, the reward function is very important for the future policy that the agent will learn. This is a general thing, but of course it also applies for congestion control. So the reward signal has to reflect the actual goal of the congestion alg uh, control algorithm that we want to design. Last aspect we have to talk about is the design of the actions. So here in this case we have a discrete action space. So an action is just a number from 1 to k. And this action, whatever the, the agent actually chooses, is used to update the congestion window or the pacing rate. So what we do is we take an action, so that's just a number, and map it with a gain function into the uh, area between uh, 0 0.75 and 1.25. And then we update the congestion window with the formula you see below. So this means we can only increase or decrease the congestion window with a factor of 25 percentage. This is good in terms of smoothness so that the congestion control algorithm cannot just modify the congestion window in steps that are so large that they could cause congestion straight away. So let's look at a, a pseudocode from a reinforcement learning congestion control algorithm. So one time step n here is roughly one round trip time long. Now what the agent does it is, is he waits for uh, an, a new acknowledgement to arrive and then he checks if the time step n actually ended and if it did then he creates an observation on the basis of the congestion signals that were returned by the acknowledgements and it computes its own reward then it shows the history of the last k uh, observation signals to the agent and also the reward and in return, it gets a new action from the agent that is used to update its own congestion window parameter. And then we move on to the next time step and send all outstanding packets. So this control loop is quite similar to the one we've seen earlier, but it of course involves a uh, reinforcement learning agent to update the congestion window. Now we can have a look at the code. Let's have a look at the uh, Comnet's MU code that actually creates this dumbbell topology here. Okay, for this, we go out. <clears throat> and we go into this folder here. This is the you can find this in app and machine learning for congestion control. There's a script that is called dumbbell.py. We enter it, we can see that we use Mininet to create our network. Okay. So if we go down, this is where the main action is happening. And we see that in the end, we just call the create dumbbell function. This is up here. Okay, and with this script, we really create the dumbbell topology. So let's have a look. In the dumbbell topology, the sources and the sinks they are in pairs. That's why we just iterate uh, over a list that is goes, just goes from one to k, and we create the source and sink pairs right here. Then we also have to create the two gateways. The command to uh, add a host, just simply add host in Mininet. The commands to add gateways or switches, just add switch. And then right down here, we create the links. Oh. So once again, we go over the source and sync pairs and we create a link that always goes from a source 
to a gate to gateway one and from gateway two to the sink and here you can already see the network parameters that we choose so bw stands for bandwidth delay stands for the propagation delay and max q size stands for um, the q size that is uh, attached to this channel and then last but not least we of course also have to create the link between gateway one and gateway two and this is our bottleneck link as you can see the bandwidth is uh, just smaller um, compared to the one up here okay and then the co the command in the mini net to start the network is just start and then what we do if this boolean auto start uh, value here is true then we just iterate over our sinks again right here and run a script that is called destination.py so this opens up a UDP socket and waits for packets to arrive and of course we also have to do the same for uh, the source nodes so we run a script that is called source.py this is where all the reinforcement learning uh, congestion control algorithm logic is inside Yes, and after the, the uh, simulation ended, we just call mininet stop, and that's it. So these two scripts, the, the source script here, it runs for uh, around about 30 seconds. So it generates traffic for 30 seconds that uh, flows through the dumbbell network to the sinks on the other side. So now we can actually run the script. So we have to go to the main folder. That's the Comnet MU folder. And where you can find the Vagrant file. And here we can start the machine by, um, by typing Vagrant up Comnet MU. And now in our case, we need the provider lib field. And that is because uh, the application that we have with machine learning for congestion control is latency sensitive. So it really needs to have accurate round trip time measurements. Now, if you take another provider like VirtualBox, it might happen that these providers add a lot of processing delay to the loop. So in other words, the, you're not measuring queuing delay. There's no queue that build up in the network, but instead what you just measure is that the CPU is slow and then the agent will interpret this as queuing delay and will do things that, are, that he's not supposed to do. So that is why we need a provider like Libfield who has the, the, the processing capabilities to give us real-time information that is quite accurate. Okay, so to go into the machine you just type Vagrant SSH Comnets MU in this folder. Now we have to wait for a second. Here we are. Okay, and now we go into Comnets MU, we go into the app folder, and here we can find machine learning for congestion control. Okay, this is the uh, folder where you can find a readme that explains you. Uh, that you have to run this with libweird as the first warning and then it also tells you uh, the, the python packages that you have to the modules that you have to install and it also tells you how to do this with pip and then we see this is the uh, the script that we want to run uh, to actually generate a dumbbell network now if you just run it like that it tells you that mininet must be run as root so that's what we're gonna do just put a sudo before and now we see what the script does it adds the controller it adds the source and sync nodes the two gateways the, it creates all the links starts the controller starts the switches and then it eventually runs the script uh, destination.py and source.py now in the most simple case when you're just running like this there's only one source node in one sync node you can also specify that there should be more and in that case we would see this line more often just with different uh, ip addresses right here
And as I said earlier, this, these scripts, they run for 30 seconds. So now it's done. And when it's done, it created uh, data files .tsv files that we can plot and look at. So let's do that. Five for free. Okay, so here we see the plot of the congestion window over time. And the agent, oh no, the, the congestion control algorithm begins with uh, exponential growth phase called slow start, as we've discussed earlier. And this phase is actually not, or this mode is not handled by the reinforcement learning agent. It is always the same. You just want to have this exponential growth to reach the capacity of the of the link as fast as possible. And then we see what happens. We overshoot it by a lot, and then we drop off. At this point here, right here, the agent takes over. So here, this is where reinforcement learning kicks in. And we can look at this point right here. We see that, uh, oh no, it's actually up here. This is the first time he measures the, the round trip time. And we see that the round trip time is very, very high. This is because we were overshooting it like a lot. And then we see that the agent, first of all, goes down. We want to decrease the latency. This is why he's going down, 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 down. And he does this until he finds the point where the latency is no longer um, decreasing anymore. So you are hitting this propagation delay barrier right here. This is around the, exactly the propagation delay of the network. So then the agent realizes that it has reduced the congestion window so far that it really reached the bandwidth delay product or the, the yeah the bandwidth delay product in this case and then we just see it continues being there for some time to observe the the round trip time before it just ramps up a little again and at this point the agent sees again this is right after five seconds so we are like here the agent sees that oh we have to increase the congestion window and the consequence is that the round trip time also goes up so this means we have been overshooting the target value the bandwidth delay product of the network this is why it increases his congestion window again and from there on he stays constant so we see this would be this line here if you would just imagine it would be the propagation delay he could also be at but he accepts a little queuing delay just stays here. Now you see that the queuing delay is a little bit, or the round trip time signal here is a little bit noisy. This is because of the processing delay. This would be much, much worse if you don't use a provider like Libvirt. It would, if you use VirtualBox, this would just jump up, have huge spikes, and the agent wouldn't know what to do. But with Libvirt, you see the congestion window is quite smooth, just a little bit above the target value of the bandwidth delay product. So the agent really learned uh, to find the bandwidth delay product of a network that uh, has a constant bandwidth delay product. Of course, if you have like a wireless uh, channel, then the capacity over time is various, so it goes up and down. So in that case, also this bandwidth delay product wouldn't be constant, it would also go up and down. And if you have a network where you actually compete with other source nodes for the resources, so for the bandwidth, then also this, this bandwidth delay product is not necessarily constant over time for you. If you want to share the bandwidth equally among all the source nodes. But in the most easiest case, and this is what we have trained the agent for, where we are just in a network by, by ourselves and the bandwidth delay product is constant. Well, in this easy case, you see that the agent really learned to converge to almost the target value, the bandwidth delay product. And we've done this by the way we uh, have engineered our reward functions and observations and uh, also the way he takes the actions to control the congestion window. So today we talked about how we can design a congestion control algorithm based on reinforcement learning. And uh, we have just demonstrated it by running the script in Vagrant. And uh, just as a conclusion and a short, in a short summary, um, 
So we have an agent, it controls the descending rate by taking its own actions. This could also be called the, the action function that can be designed. And this agent observes a mixture of, of uh, congestion signals. And these signals reflect the state of the network. So they can be noisy, they can be uncertain. But uh, this is what the agent sees, and it's part of the observation function, what kind of signals you actually show to the agent. And then we also have the reward function. So the way we design the reward, in our case, we chose a function that maximizes throughput and minimizes delay. This is, and also minimizes the, the packet losses. And uh, so the conclusion is, we have designed a very basic uh, reinforcement learning congestion control algorithm. But we have seen that uh, these action function, the observation function and reward functions, they have to be engineered with expert knowledge. So you have to understand the domain, you have to understand the, the field to, to, to engineer these functions so the agent can actually work properly. So this is your degrees of freedom from the perspective of an engineer and uh, you want the machine learning to do the rest. But it is very important, for example, with the reward function, that you really have a reward function that uh, reflects what you want to achieve with your algorithm. Because otherwise, the agent will eventually learn to maximize this reward function. And if it's not precisely what you want, the agent will learn a policy that you didn't want it to learn in the first place. Okay, so thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you learned something. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.